Welcome. You're listening to Sports Econ 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Today's show is going to be really fun because of your friend, Bruce. Shooty Babbitt. Shooty Babbitt. One of the yeah. great names of baseball. That's right. Yeah, Shooty, gonna... yeah, Shooty's a scout. Uh, he does a lot of uh, television commentary pre- and post-game for the Oakland A's, and he's a Bay Area guy, but he... Right now, as we speak to him, he's, he's going to be traveling. Uh, he's down in Texas, so he's going to tell us all about what he's up to and also some great stories about Billy Martin. Who, uh, he was Billy's, Billy was his manager back in the early 80s. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got a quote here from uh, Billy Martin. I have to ask Shooty when he comes on yeah. in the next segment if it's, if it's really true that Billy said this. Okay. Okay. Uh, in fact, you know what? I did a little research and found out that he received more, Billy, Shooty did, received more Rookie of the Year votes than George Bell and Mike Witt. Wow. That's pretty, pretty impressive, impressive pretty isn't impressive, it? Pretty impressive, yeah. Only lost to uh, uh, Rigetti. That's right. Oh, Dave Rigetti. Yeah. Dave Rigetti, yeah. 1981. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, and at every commercial break, we're going to ask a trivia question, and the uh, first three emails we receive with the correct answer are going to win a free three day, two night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Uh, vacations are free. They're only request the $75 cleaning fee to cover the housekeeping expenses uh, because the uh, radio station is not supporting the uh, contest is Lighthouse Resort and Marina. And today's trivia theme is because, of course, we're talking basketball later on with the uh, uh, all the playoffs that are going on. Do you know Kobe Bryant? Hmm. All right. So all the little particulars. All, all particulars about Kobe Bryant. Okay. All right. And not the easy ones like, you you know, what number eight and number yeah. 24. I mean, I mean, I didn't, you know, something I didn't know he was number eight. So really? No, I, I'm, not, I'm not into numbers except for when, the ones that I remember when I was a kid. But let's not get off on a tangent there. I, I remember all the all the Giants and all the sure. Yankees from the from the early '60s. But after about 1970, I, I then, don't. I well, don't and Bonds changed his number. right? Now, Bonds, you remember because Barry's dad yeah. wore the same number, 25. Yeah, Bobby wore number 25. Number 20, that's yeah, right. that's right. There you go. Then of course there was his godfather. William Ace, number 24. 24. All right. right, stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. When we come back, we're going to have Shooty Babbitt on. Uh, All right, Shooty so that's our, that's our first little interlude here. We're almost ready I'm going to go save the Shooty file here, and then we're going to interview you there. Okay, so let's do this here. How's the weather down there in Texas? Uh, yesterday was 91. Today is supposed to cloudy and windy. Okay. Some about rain. I mean, all this weather changing over the yeah, last few years uh, makes for some, you know, if you if you live in a hot weather place like Texas or Arizona, whew, yeah. man, in the in the summertime it's going to be brutal. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty humid there, isn't it? He said, yeah, yeah. It's too bad. Not, not too bad. bad. Not that bad. It's hot. Yeah. All right, you guys ready? Here we go. All right, let's go to number two. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGon. Bruce, why don't you introduce our guest? Yeah, Shooty Babbitt is a, is a personal friend of mine. Uh, we've worked alongside each other for a number of years. He's also a local guy who grew up in Berkeley, uh, came up through the Oakland A's farm system, was an outstanding player in 1981. And you might remember that year because that was a year there was a baseball strike in the middle of the season. The A's won the American League West first half, I believe, and lost the second half, but won the playoff games against Kansas City, and then played the Yankees for the National for the American League Championship Series, which they lost. Billy Martin was managing the Oakland A's then, and uh, they, had, uh, they had some pretty good plays. Let's ask Shooty about it. Uh, Shooty, tell us a little bit about 1981, because that was your rookie year in the major leagues, and Billy Martin was your skipper. And during the strike. Too. And during the strike, yeah, right in the middle of the season, you had a, what is it, a 60-day strike. Yeah, guys. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Sure. Uh, it was a quite interesting year. I was coming off my worst year as a professional. I hit 234 that year in Triple A, which was my first year in Triple A, and I was a 22 round draft pick. So I kind of was real nervous because this year was pretty much I had to go out and produce a and feel the wrath of being released. But after that year, I even marked down the ball the club and hired Billy Martin. Instruction on me for the first time because they wanted to see what they had in the system. Um, I was lucky enough to get invited as an older guy, if you will, at 21 at that time. <laughs> and uh, possibly taking my instructor down there and he felt that I had not tapped into my speed enough. And I stole 39 bases and 39 attempts. Billy Martin got wind of what I was doing down there, what the system was, and all I was doing. 
it, it might be training and non roster. And uh, it kind of just kept going, and I ended up putting a job in spring training to make in the club. So my first impression of Philly was great. He was from Berkeley, great to think. It was the same high school, pretty much grew up in the same neighborhood, just a little west of uh, me and Berkeley. And um, lo and behold, midway through the season, three quarters away the season, he had a very tough game in Cleveland. All of the influence made a, an error in that game. And for some reason, Philly seemed to be more perplexed by the one that I made. And I got to dug it in the doghouse yeah because I was saying you uh you, you know you hit 256 which you know is, is respectable and for some reason you know like you said I guess there's something uh, to do with Billy on this but uh you, did you is it true you only lasted the, just the one year and then what you had a little stint with Montreal yeah, then I left here. Uh, Max Richardson uh, was the general manager in AAA with the Expos. Uh, I had an opportunity to sign with the Giants. Uh, Frank Robinson wanted me, but uh, that didn't happen. Jack McKeon wanted me in San Diego, but I had to clear waivers, and they did not want me to wait. They ended up signing Alan Wiggins uh, instead, and we know what a great career he ended up having. Uh, but I signed with the Expos. I might be the worst. But I went over there and they had a big league club over there. Jerry Manville, Rodney Scott. I mean, talk about some good players over there. So uh, I messed around the Triple X for a couple of years. I didn't have a family and kids. that didn't marry anything. I thought it was time to get some roots in the ground. So uh, at that time, I chose to uh, pack it in and start living a real life. You know, you know it's funny. Um, so Shooty and I are kind of close to the same age, and I remember him playing. And it's kind of funny because I was thinking, you know, before we were doing the show, before I actually looked at statistics, I'm thinking, oh yeah, he probably played, you know, a good five, six, seven, eight years, because I remembered him. And and to look back and go, oh my gosh, there was only just that one year, but you made an impression on me, Shooty. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was blessed, and they called me King of the Parlay, man. King of the Parlay. Four games in the major leagues, and thirty years later, actually, I've been a part of the Oakland. How you got your name? I'm sorry? Uh, tell us how you get how you got your name. Your nickname. talk about the here and the now but I, I do want to harken back a few more a few more minutes to some of your teammates because one guy that really intrigues me and you mentioned if we didn't uh, mention this before I should say that shooty grew up in Berkeley you mentioned that you knew you were from not not from the same neighborhood as Billy but not that far away Billy Martin of course but another guy who grew up in the East Bay two guys actually who grew up in the East Bay who played with you that year were of course Mike Norris and uh, the other guy was Ricky Henderson. And, and, and boy, you talk about two guys that had different kind of careers, but both were, they had they made an impression that year, huh? They were outstanding players, and that's another great thing. I just spent four days with Ricky in Oakland when he was going to work for the game. So to be able to play and be a friend of, uh, turns out with the best of Sean Peter and the pitch we had a game yeah. is a blessing all in itself. And Mike Norris was one of the greatest personalities uh, he loved to play. He was my locker mate. Uh, and, you know, Mike Smith had his issues, but anybody had a problem with Mike Norris, he must have had a problem with him. You know, that was one of the most genuine people that I've ever met in my life. And, uh, man, oh, man, a year that he won 20 games, he should have been the Cy Young winner. I think Jim Palmer might have won it, but uh, he was part of a great staff that we had to have won 20 games and 
Jack and the Shakespeare game. So, uh, and I uh, see Mike occasionally now, and he knows he's really dear to my heart. Uh, and you also played with Wayne Murphy, too, didn't you? Yes, I did. I just saw Murph yesterday and this morning. Yeah, Murph today. And uh, so with this memory, and it's just amazing how this thing goes, balls. I was the first week out, I was in Beloit, Wisconsin, and uh, Michael Davis is my best friend. So oh, yeah. also on that team. Yep. And he's a hitting coach for the Seattle Mariners. So uh, I got nothing. That's what's so great about baseball. You know, we've got a big family, and uh, occasionally we'll get a chance to see each other and talk about the old times. Well, well, for those who don't, yeah. remember, for those who don't remember Dwayne Murphy, the one thing I always remembered about him was he would make these fantastic catches in the outfield where he would kind of basically pretend he'd basically fake everybody out. Like he dropped the ball, or or no, not not dropped it. Like it was a home. He'd steal a home run away, and he would pretend like the, the it went over the fence for a home run. And the guy would be trotting around. By the time he rounded third base, he'd kind of come up with the ball. He did. He must have done that at least four or five times. It just it seemed to always make. Well, he, he was a great outfielder. Should did you remember seeing a center fielder any better? I mean, this guy was was a master of his profession at center field, Dwayne Murphy. Yeah, I mean, six gold gloves, you know, but what made him so great is that he aired out the ball over his head. Yeah. Every, every line drive away from him, place was shallow. Rip was going back, and that's why he was able to uh, see so many guys back there jump up and act like all oh, the ball was over his head, and they'd be running around and making oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's like Tris Speaker used to be a, a that's, short speaker? Yeah, Same thing. Yeah. 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 Wearing his hat halfway yeah. over his head. Mm. He didn't like to run with his hat on, so he always wanted his hat to fall off. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like Willie Mays used yeah. to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, hey guys, we're going to cut to our first commercial break, and again, the theme is. Kobe Bryant. Do you know Kobe Bryant? This one, to me, this is a hard one, I think. Okay. Maybe Shooty knows. Maybe okay. Shooty knows. Yeah. Okay. Who was known as the Kobe Stopper? Mm. All right. Okay. The first three emails with the correct answer were a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com to answer this question. Talking Kobe Bryant here. Who was known as the Kobe Stopper? In other words, a guy that shut Kobe Bryant exactly. down. Exactly. Now, you're saying, I don't okay. even remember this guy playing. Okay. But but again, we're talking Kobe Bryant, so okay. we're not talking the 1940s or 50s. Right? No, more recent. Okay, stay yeah. with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101 with our guest, Shooty Babbitt, and we will be right back. Okay. Shooty, I don't have a clue on that one, do you? Man, I don't know why. I don't know. Yeah, are you at least your fan? Let's, yeah. call, let's call Kobe up. I'm, I'm heading as soon as this show is over. I'm heading right out to uh, Oakland for the uh, Warriors' first game against Houston tonight. That'll be a lot of fun. Right. Yeah, I, you know Houston. I, six o'clock, six o'clock our time, so eight o'clock your time. I think they'll have an easier time with Houston. Yeah, it's the reason um, that all the conference and the championship games start at six West Coast time, just so they get the. You know, maximum number of people watching. You know, I think they have a, we'll have an easier time with Houston than we could. I don't know. You know, everybody says that. Houston is kind of a, you're probably right, but Dwight, uh, Dwight Howard, when he wants to be motivated, is, yeah. is terrific. And you've got Josh Smith, who's came over from Detroit, who's been outstanding. And you got Harden, who's angry about not being MVP. And, you know, they don't have the bench the Warriors have, but I, I think they might win a couple games. But do you ever, you ever notice, like, with Harden, the chips are down, man. I mean, he just... Oh, he just takes, takes over. He takes over. over. Well, he's, he'll just miss everything. Well, he, he's, he's not, not afraid, though. With the hot thunder, yeah, but he's not, he's not afraid. That's what no, you that's want. True. You want that with Curry. You want that with, you know, LeBron. Those guys are that way. Yeah. All right, here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. When we cut to the first commercial break, we asked this trivia question again about Kobe Bryant. Who was known as the Kobe Stopper? And I have no clue. Should he, uh, you have an idea? I'm just going to throw a name out there to somebody like John Starks. Oh, I mean, that's a, yeah, that would have been a good John one. John Starks, he was a good defender, yeah. Reuben Patterson. Reuben Patterson, big guy with, uh, I believe, I think yeah. he, Seattle. Yeah. Yeah, 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 he was a tough dude. He was kind of like a John Brisker, kind of like a, a, beyond, a smaller version of DeAndre Jordan, just big, bruising guy. I remember him. He, he was not a spectacular player, but he was a tough defender. Yeah, I don't even remember him. Well, I remember him now, but yeah. I would, uh, he's not in my memory bank unless you... Snap your fingers. Okay, now, now we've got we've got on the line Shooty Babbitt, yeah. former Oakland A's and uh, baseball scout and now television analyst. Uh, I do want to ask you a quick question. This does have to do with Billy Martin. I read somewhere it said that Billy Martin once quipped 
if you ever see Shooty Babbitt play second base for me again, I want you to shooty me. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, that's yeah, kind of gnarly. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I, I know you got mixed feelings. You were saying you appreciated Billy in the late Billy Martin. He's been yeah, gone yeah. for 26 years. But he did have, he had a dark side. And I remember he got fired from the team the next year and trashed his office. He, he burned out of New York. He was, you know, he knew baseball as well as anybody. But he had a, he had a really kind of a dark side, didn't he, Shooty? Yeah, they were at I come in to be here up on Clubhouse. Uh, I knew that he had a problem in Cleveland. And we were losing this game, and it was a threat of rain. And uh, he was hoping that we got rained out. It, in the second game, we're winning, and we're in the top of the fourth inning, and now it starts to rain. And Billy looks up at the sky and he starts cussing God. Well, he got into so many fights. I mean, he would pick a fight at a bar. I, I mean, half the stories you hear, actually, not only more than half of them are tr probably true to, to uh, you know every minute detail, but there are probably another ten or twenty that you don't or you've never heard about. How tall was he? He wasn't that big guy, but he was a scrapper. Did he have like small man's complex or something? Uh, just a tough, tough dude. Wasn't he kind of you know he was a great player uh, shooting? Yeah. Was it was it just he was a fiery little guy, wasn't he? He just had no fear. I remember. Something had happened, and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I hear Billy squeaking on um, the door next door. Look, we keep looking down to the door. At this time, I'm in the doghouse now. So I hear him squeaking on the door. I'm trying to see how the big wall, big lawyer, Mark Fowler, Billy Tyson, Billy Tyson, Billy Tyson, on the door. Open the door. You got to open the door. I'm like, yes, yeah, sir. Open the door. <laughs> and, you know, this time I'm in the doghouse, I'm like, swim. Open the door and just. He was something else. He had his little crew. You mentioned Cleet Boyer and Art Fowler and Lee Walls. They were his they were his drinking buddies and they hung out with him. But as you said, I mean he always burned out. He brought the A's back to prominence for one year and then they you know kind of went back in the toilet for a few years and then Tony La Russa brought him back. I gotta ask you about Tony La Russa, before we get into the contemporary stuff, you know, he just retired a couple of years ago. Um, you know, kind of a hard guy to, to really like, but boy, uh, as far as understanding the game of baseball and being prepared, I can't think of a better manager. Well, um, I have a different outlook on that. I mean, one thing that I can say about Tony La Russa is that he takes care of his guys. Mm. And Dave Stewart, who has deserved an opportunity as a general manager for a long time, especially all this stuff going on in baseball about minority team opportunity and all this kind of stuff. Um, Dave Stewart is the one guy that probably just deserved the opportunity that never got it. And once Tony La Russa got into the position, he identified Dave Stewart right away as a guy that he felt that was capable to be a general manager who hadn't gotten an opportunity. So um, just for that, I'm happy for um, Stewart, and I have a lot of when Stewart is such a good guy, too. I remember when Stewart retired. Uh, I don't know if I told you this story, Edward. Stewart retired, and they had a press conference in the morning, and Dave was so overcome with emotion. He cried off and on during the press conference, and all of us reporters, all the hard bitten reporters, half of us were crying with him. Wow. And it was a great moment because he was showing his emotion. He was crying, and he was speaking, and he was, you know, breaking up. And it was just, it was tough for him to walk away from the game because he was, for four years, this guy was the best pitcher in baseball. Well, I can remember is watch him on the mound. Spit the hat way down and oh, yeah. that stare. That death stare. And then he had that little high voice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Shooty, let's talk about the here and the now. We've got some great stories in the early season, seven, eight weeks into the season. And I'm looking at the standings right now, and, and Houston was going to be good. I, I thought they were going to be good, and so were the Mets. But, man, both these teams look like they uh, have their sights set maybe on a postseason bid this year. Yeah, and it's amazing because there are some great stories that they put in about my New York Mets all a lot this year about the postseason on the team. Michael Kadire as a champ coming here and just changed the whole culture of the ball club. 
lot more professional group, a lot more than we have in the middle. It rubs off on everybody. Everybody's going for each other and fighting each other. Look at you. I mean, they've really gone in head over heels for analysis. I mean, they quantitatively measure everything as far as what they're doing, and they're having success. And I'm not one that has gone all in on that particular old school. So uh, happy for those people because they've been losing and been bad for so long. I'm all about this business of team sports. So when they've got great stories like that, it's only hands on deck. Yeah. Hey, Judy, I wanted to ask you about how did you transition from playing to getting to be a baseball scout? That's a good question. Um, after I got out of the game, I uh, had to take a breather. I got to the work. My dad went to the great service for small business, and I became a breather, manning a tow truck driver, a service manager. And, um, I was going to take the business over. I was on my way, and two of my uh, customers, one of them was a former roommate of mine in Double Lake, Mark Brown, who's a well known scout in our city, Jerry Goodwin. And he knew my passion, um, my knowledge of the game, and he told me if I ever wanted to get in, let him know. And then one time an opportunity came up in Atlanta, they needed a guy, and he asked me if I wanted to get back. And um, I started out as a area guy where I was in the Lake working in business for a while. And Lo and behold, before you know it, the Diamondbacks uh, got a new uh, franchise. And my boss in Atlanta went to Arizona and he wanted me to come with him. And it's been 21 years since that day happened. So Whoa. Wow. First year scout. You yeah, know, the, Charles Scott's a friend of mine. Uh, from oh, Arizona. that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I grew up with him. Yeah. He's a guy over here in Marin County. You know, it's, it's tough, though, being a scout, Shooty, because being a ball player is tough enough because you're on the road so much. I think scouts are on the road sometimes oh, wow. more than ball players are. Yeah, I think the, the toughest part is the commitment. Um, I'm a family man. I've got three children. Now they're grown now, but that was the toughest part. You know, just the games and graduations and birthdays. Um, fortunately for me, most of my work was in Northern California. Then once I became a major league scout, most of my work took place in the Coliseum or uh, Pac Dell at that time. So uh, the kids miss every single week, and they get snatch a significant chunk out of my opportunities to see my kids, but on the flip side, I was able to provide for them, and my dad always told me the toughest thing for a man to do is to be a good provider and a good father. Yeah. Time, so, that, that's true. So I got to yeah, I got to record my business show tomorrow, and I told my team, I said, but I've got to record an hour earlier because my daughter's sports night is at school. Oh, and I said, go. I got to go there for her. You got to be there. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you, when you're at the Coliseum, you're, you're, you're watching existing ball players versus, you know, people who are, you know, like high school players trying to figure out if they're going to uh, be, uh, you know, if you're going to try to put in a word in for them. How does that work? Do you just kind of like look at the, at the other team and you just start kind of analyzing them and deciding, you know, we need a new first baseman or whatever? Well, my role, I have two subordinates that keep me, Daniel, and the bear me. And I'm responsible from the, the B club all the way down to the low club. There's 25, you know, each lot. My job is going for five days, watching everybody, evaluate them, grade on what they are, what they might be, where they might fit with us. If something ever comes up with the player and the best of the Angels, Mariners, or any organization, what dialogue is used with them is we're going to go to the computer and see what information I have on them, and then we'll start up this talk and then this business. So that's how things get started. But we can have 10 guys that do the exact same thing that I do, three or four weeks for all 30 teams, each team twice, once before the trade deadline, and once after. And how intricate can you be? Like, you know, the guy does well on Tuesday night games, you know, and if the wind's blowing 10 miles, I mean, you know, I, I just wonder how, what kind of statistics, uh, you know, you can throw into these things. Well, I'm not a stat guy because okay. John Sherbo, when he first gave me an opportunity, he told me shooting uh, numbers and nothing more than an autopsy. All they do is just what has happened. So I have to judge my eyes and use my ears. So I have five days, three swings. Kind of with their instincts, I'm going to tell you what kind of player they're going to be. I mean, power, speed, ability, and instincts, they normally jump out at you. So, you don't play good during those five days while I'm watching you. Pretty much, I'm not going to have any issues with you just with the wrong day. Yeah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, well, guys, we're going to cut to our second commercial break. 
again, we're in the uh, uh, we, on the phone here. We have Shooty Babbitt. Uh, but the commercial, excuse me, the commercial break trivia question. Here we go. Kobe Bryant. In 2003, Kobe tied a record for the most three pointers in a game. Whose record did he tie, and how many three pointers? Mm. Okay, kind of a double question. Oh, that's, that's another tough one. All right. Yeah. So here's the question again. In 2003, Kobe tied a record for the most three pointers in a game. Whose record did he tie, and how many three pointers? Stay with us. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. All right. This is fun. Yeah, I just see that Dan Jenkins, the general manager of the Marlins, has been named their new manager. Is that right? Yep. Well, I guess, you know, I've heard Jeffrey Loria is a strange dude. I remember interviewing him once, and this was the year that they played the Giants, and they upset him and went on to then upset the oh, Cubs and then smoked the Yankees. And he is just, I can't figure that guy out. I guess during the near no hitter the other night when the Braves were in town, <laughs> he got up in the fourth inning, and that's when he decided to fire. Uh, Redmond, and it's just, I, I don't know. I mean, I know the guy, he's a baseball fan, but I think he's just a little strange. What do you think, Shooty? Well, that's how people do a lot of money are. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> True. Some of them are that. Yeah, if I had his money, I'd throw mine away. Um, <laughs> so, the, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, I heard Bochi named Brian Price as, as one of his. Uh, yeah. For, the, for the All-Star game, I'm thinking, you know, Brian's a, a local guy yeah, here, right. but this is like his second year manager. Yeah, I mean, like maybe he felt comfortable, who knows, but yeah. some kind of connection, you know? Cool. Yeah. All right. Okay, you guys ready? Yes. There we go. See if you know the Thanks answer. for hanging in there, Shuggy. I yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. That's okay, great. We Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown and Bruce McGowan here. When we cut to the second commercial break, we asked this trivia question about Kobe Bryant. We want to know how much you know about Kobe. In 2003, Kobe tied a record for the most three-pointers in a game. Whose record did he tie, and how many three-pointers? Shouldn't you got that one? I'm going to say, I'm going to just guess. I'm going to say, like, 10? No idea. Okay, so the, the answer is 12. 12, okay. Danielle Marshall. Daniel Marshall was the former oh, Warrior. Warrior. Yeah, he hit twelve three pointers. Three pointers. Oh, the Warriors must. Yeah, those were during some bad years yeah. when they were desperate. <laughs> Daniel Daniel Marshall was a good player, yeah, though. Good player, sure. Very. But yeah, for him to be able to point at these three stuff, you can imagine how many he must have hit. So yeah. He, <laughs> well, and the thing was, Daniel Marshall was not a guard; he was a forward, and that was a, the, Yeah, he was like six eight, six six nine. So that's maybe a guard was guarding him. Well, maybe yeah, he was like maybe he was like Magic in, in his in his mind. He was thinking, you know, I, I can, you know, Magic was a really, he was a real hybrid. I mean, center, center played center. Yeah. I mean, he did play center did, in, yeah. in the championship yeah. game against uh, well, something. <laughs> that's true. that's true. Magic was an amazing passer. <laughs> but we're getting off topic here, Edward. Uh, okay, so we have uh, Shooty Babbitt, uh, former A. And uh, he's also now now he's a television analyst. So yeah. you, Current you, scout, Current too. scout too. Yeah. yeah so how, how'd you get into the television part? Ah, you know I have to get I would have to get Marty McClure ready for that because he introduced me to radio. Um, he had his show inside baseball, and um, I don't know we just met one day in the press box and we started having baseball conversation. And next thing you know, he asked me if I'd mind being on his show. And, I was on again the week after, and then he talked about maybe we should have a Saturday show. So then once we did that, uh, I guess Rob Jarman was going to be a host, but he yeah. yeah. came up with him, and uh, Marty Lord recommended that they gave me a shot. And uh, lo and behold, uh, it went pretty well, and each year I've been getting a little bit more opportunity. And so, I mean, my various ties, my relationship with the TV and those things have been with that so far, so uh, to be a good fit, and so far it's been working out pretty good. That, that's kind of how I got into radio, was I filled in on KNBR for, it was, it was more of a business show, but it happened to be on KNBR, and uh, the, the host said, hey, uh, you know what, you're doing a pretty good job here, why don't you, you know, help me co-host? I said, sure. Then after a while, he kind of went away, and I hosted it for a while, so it's kind of, yeah. It's you're just like me, you love to talk, and she's the it. same way. <laughs> Shooty, the great thing about Shooty is, not only do you get... The information, but you get a story to go with it, which is which is wonderful. That's it. Yeah, I got to ask you that. Going back to now, and again, we're, we talked about two teams that are kind of surprising in the National League, uh, the American League right now with with uh, the Yankees in first place. Now it's they're not really that impressive, but they still. I, I thought maybe this team was a little, you know, weak as far as pitching is concerned. They got some good young, some good young arms, but 
They're certainly end up hitting, uh, and it is early. But I mean, what's your impression of the Yankees this year in Boston and, and Tampa? Because it looks like uh, it's going to be kind of a, and even Baltimore is within range. I mean, this is crazy. And Toronto's in range. I mean, that that division is is wide open. Well, we're still pretty early. In it is, but I mean, that division is, is definitely wide open. Four and a half games separate the five teams, uh, Shooty. Well, uh, I think the most surprising part is the pitching. I mean, I think they still could get four runs. So uh, with the A's, they have uh, they've always had a low payroll. They they still have a low payroll. Um, do you think that's one of the main reasons that they're in the cellar? You know, I think injuries. The reason why they're in the cellar right now is just that they don't have a lot of experienced good players on them. Uh, they trade they a have lot of them. Injuries. They traded away some good players. I mean, this is a team that doesn't really have a whole lot of. So they, I think they've lost something like 13 out of 14 one-run games, and we, yeah. where they did win one the other night, so it's two now. But their home record shooting is five and 14. You're not going to go anywhere if you can't defend your home turf. Well, I just think they ain't got to learn how to win. I mean, let alone uh, play better baseball. They got to learn how to win. I just, you know, Bob Miller does a tremendous job with his players and managers, and these guys just only have so many tricks up their Basketball, it's such a team sport, and and baseball is, but there's so much individuality. You know, when you're up at the plate, you're the only one up at the plate. You know, obviously turning double plays is a little bit different, but how do you mentally get over that? You know, of, of coming in and going, okay, well we are a team. And, you know, I know you got to have cohesiveness. Um, you know, what, mentally, like, what do you do? Well, you can do control. Go for it, that. Control, 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 Superstars, like you said, like you know Robinson Cano, you know, etc. Well, a lot of teams. One of the problems is too. Shooty will, will admit to this that uh, a lot of teams think they can solve a problem by bringing in big names, and it usually doesn't work. Sometimes it does. The Yankees people forget they had four guys, five guys that were there for years. You know, Pettit, uh, Mariano Rivera, Jorge Posada, Derek Jeter, and Bernie Williams. They were the core of that team. But they brought in, they mixed and matched these other guys. If you don't have a, a couple of those guys, you're not going to win. And it just seems to me like the Dodgers. Yeah, you know they, they had the, you know the higher one of the higher payrolls. Well, you know again, it's it's all about team chemistry, isn't it, Judy? I mean, if you, you, 
That's something we talk about in basketball that's so important. How about baseball? Is team chemistry, it, it's not vital, but it's it's one of the little components that, that can make a difference. Well, that depends on what you consider sports, bro. Mm. Some people don't age to There's that quote by, uh, the, the, you know, the, that, yeah, the shooter, you know that quote from Tommy Lasorda, where he says, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. You're, you're going to win a third of your games. You're going to lose a third of your games. No matter how good or bad you are, it's that extra third. What are you going to do with that? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's a big statement. Yeah. How And how do you create a winning culture? I mean, in New York, they had it for a while. They're, they're trying to get it back again. They were certainly in contention. But in St. Louis and in San Francisco now, you have had a winning culture in place. And I guess that starts at the top, doesn't it? It has to start with ownership and management. Absolutely. That, look at the game. I don't care if you're born up here in my world. Once you get over there, you know that people have to speak. Nobody has to tell you. Like Yasiel Puig, for instance, who's a great talent down in Los Angeles, but my gosh, and granted, his story is amazing, escaping from Cuba, but I mean, guaranteeing a guy that much money, I guess they needed to do that to, to make sure that nobody else got him. Well, if nobody else will give you five money, you can make a difference because they have it, trying to outdo the next year, you wouldn't have that problem. That's what I'm saying. If you live by the standards of total conduct, and it will throughout the whole. Also, I'm sure the uh, Players Association would not appreciate the legal uh, term of uh, price fixing, which is illegal. You know, the owners get together, hey, listen, we're not going to pay anybody over a million dollars a year. Is that a and, that, and that happened back in 1987. I mean, Major League Baseball paid out a ton of money. But I, I, what Judy was saying is so right. And people, we all give lip service to this, but yet we keep going along. And again, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but Judy, you ought to run for political office. Yeah, kind of like awesome, that. man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you don't want the headaches, though. You'd rather be around baseball like, like the rest no, of us. I'd rather appreciate, you know, like pay everybody, let's say, you know, half a million dollars a year, and then for certain milestones, you, you know, they get big bonuses. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a great idea, but in, in theory, but in practice, it's never going to happen because you're not going to have every team, you know, going along with that. We were talking earlier off mic about Jeffrey Lawyer, the, the owner of the Miami Marlins, who's just one of the strangest dudes I've ever met. And his teams have had, he had a, he, he took the Expos out of uh, Montreal. He sold the Expos so that they left Montreal and went to Washington, which is great. But now, you know, he's he's rebuilt this team a couple of times. He fired his manager the other day and hired his general manager to replace him as the manager. What in the world is going that on there? Doesn't, that doesn't usually work out. Doesn't well. work out well at all usually. Shitty, what's your impression of Jeffrey Loria? Oh, man. He's just seen off the cuff. One thing I have also learned, everybody has their own company, their own organization, have a right to run it.
players, manager, uh, into the World Series, uh, outstanding person, just to make it to that home without his car. If you hire a guy like him, then you've got a young team, yeah. a young player that will probably need someone like a Dusty Baker to say, okay, I'm at the band that not only is he a great manager, but also a great business. Hey, Shooty, you stay, stay with us. We're going to cut to our last commercial break, and then we're going to uh, let you go when we come back for the next break. Hold on a second. Uh, Co talking Kobe Bryant here, last trivia question. Against which team did Kobe score 81 points? Mm. Remember that big one? Okay. Stay with us. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back with some closing comments. All right. And again, I'm drawing a blank. I, I just can't. I think it's, I'm having a senior moment, Shooty. I'm 63, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I hate it. I hate to say this though, but I did not follow the NBA as as nearly as closely from about 1995 till about 2007 because the Warriors were so bad. When you don't have a team to follow, I yeah. followed it casually, you know, but I didn't watch it every night. And, and if you don't have a team to follow in your area, and you're not, and, you know, that was my job this covering the Warriors. This is the first year I'm getting really getting into the playoffs. I, I yeah. covered about 20 Warrior games a season during those awful yeah. years, and I, you know. The players that just came and went, it was like a merry-go-round. The coaches that came and went, and it, it was just, you know, I, I, my enthusiasm for the game kind of, it's so much more fun now. It is. And it, 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 same it is. with baseball. Like, for a long time, the Giants yeah. not playing well. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean. But I love baseball too much. Yeah. So. baseball's different. Listen, I still root for the Louisville Colonels. Oh, there you go. All right. Okay. That's before your time. All right. Ready? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm older than you. <laughs> yeah, okay. You're shooting. You're, you're, you're a young man. That's you're right. like shooting. You got to you go, go back to the 1890s. There, you go. there you go. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. When we cut to the third commercial break, we asked this trivia question. Talking Kobe Bryant. Against which team did Kobe score 81 points? And I'm going to let Shooty Babbitt, our guest, answer that one, because I, th I think he knows the answer. Well, since you remember, I'm about to say Kobe scored. No, not this one. It was the uh, Toronto Raptors. Really? Yeah, 2006. Okay. Uh, we have any LA fans out there. They'll say, geez, how, how did you not know how that? How did you not know that yeah. one? Because <laughs> yeah. I know Shooty's enough. <laughs> there you That's go. That's right, exactly. The Lighthouse Resort. Um, all right, well, you know what, Judy? We're going to let you go. We really appreciate you spending all this time with us. Uh, great show, great stories about you and Billy Martin and uh, being a scout and everything else. Well, thanks for having me, John. All right. Judy, it's always good catching up with you, man. Good good to, and also, congratulations to your son. Uh, Judy's son has just graduated from college, and uh, and he played baseball uh, in San Francisco with uh, the Academy of Arts College. Very cool. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Well, he's a good guy. I, and I, I told Shooty originally we'd have him on for about half an hour, and I, I don't think he minds going a little longer. Because Just a little longer. Not, yeah, not no, too, not too much. He loves the business of broadcasting. All right, so here's our thoughts for the day. Bob Hope Golf quote. These are kind of fun. I'd like to play in the low 70s. If it gets any hotter than that, I'll stay in the bar. <laughs> you know, Bob Hope played until he was almost, I think he was about 90, 95 or close to 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. he was amazing. It says here, and uh, if you watch a game, it's fun. If you play it, it's recreation. If you work at it, it's golf. Good, good point. <laughs> Very good point. Okay, tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective, giving away more free vacations for answering sports trivia questions. Hopefully, we'll have the ones a, a little bit easier. Oh, no, that's good, though. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, plumbing the depths, but that's good stuff. Yeah. And I bet you a lot of listeners knew those answers. So some of them will. Oh, again, like you said, the ones in L.A., they'll be going, oh, yeah. how did you not know that? Yeah, well, again, Kobe Bryant fans are everywhere. You that's know? right. Maybe, I wonder if Kobe would have even remembered some of these questions about <laughs> right. himself. I think he would. In fact, he was number 33. I wonder if he's prior the, to he's in, college, in, in uh, high school. And I, I, I was going to say, I wonder if Kobe's even going to come back, though, because oh, he's yeah. had the injury problems with him, and I just don't know. Don't know. Yeah. All right, so tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. Good. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. All right, good stuff. It's funny, I asked.